One of the challenges of being a follower of Jesus, of Yeshua, is you. <laughs> Other followers <laughs> of him. And I know every one of you is thinking right now, right back at you. <laughs> and so the question really is how do we live with each other? And particularly when some of us cling to certain ideas about God or what he requires of us so strongly that anybody who doesn't come along in just that way yeah, probably not really a follower of Jesus. Some years ago, um, I took a trip to Israel for a couple of weeks for a Hebrew immersive. And as many of you know, uh, I'm the dean of a group of Anglican churches sort of here in the Midwest, which means that sometimes I get us all together. <laughs> I have no authority. Uh, and most of those churches do not have women in ministry. We do. And we disagree with the leadership of those other churches on this issue. But we have covenanted to love each other in spite of that difference. And we acknowledge and respect that difference in each other, knowing that it's, this is not a salvation issue. It might be a sanctification issue, it might be a holy living issue, it might be a cultural issue, it might be an interpretation issue, but whatever it is, we love each other regardless. And while I was in Israel, and I, incommunicado, because I basically said, I'm doing an immersion, don't bother me. So nobody was texting me or calling or anything, I was just immersed there. Wonderful, wonderful period of time. Someone who knew all of the leadership of these local churches, who wasn't a part of us, didn't even live in this state, sent a message to all of the other leaders, except the leaders of this congregation, which said basically, how dare you be in relationship with a congregation that permits a woman in the pulpit. You know better, and you need to get out of that relationship and find a godly bishop who will enforce the theology that we know is correct. And they did that while I was away, knowing that I was away, hoping that somehow they would convict all of these hearts to suddenly reject us and go somewhere else. Rebecca was here. Judy was here. Neither of them had to defend us because every one of those other leaders rose up and defended us and said, how dare you make such an accusation and especially make it, well, uh, George is traveling and suggests that somehow our love for each other and our covenant with each other is something that we should break because of your theology. Even if we agree with your theology, we should cast them aside, shun them. How dare you? And clearly they did not follow the exhortation of this person from another state. I bring that up because I'm going to talk about kosher today and kosher regulations. And many Christians, even on hearing me say those words, would say, what the heck does that have to do with us? You know, we're not Jews. Well, some of us are. <laughs> but, but even for those of us who are or aren't, what does that have to do with us? And most of you know that we have a rule here uh, for our own egg, for our 
lunch, our joy together, and when we do Passover, when we do other celebrations. And, and the simple rule is, please, no pork or shellfish. That's it. Full period. Stop. Full period. Full stop. Period. Full stop. And I've said some time ago, I'm going to sort of explain that at some point, but it, the time hadn't come and hadn't been able to do it. I'm going to spend the time this morning. There are two key sources for our approach on this question, why no pork or shellfish? The biblical commands about what food is considered suitable or unsuitable, and what the New Testament teaches in terms of hospitality and food. This isn't legalistic. It's actually, I think, you'll find really interesting when we understand why it's important. Now, before I begin to dive a little deeply into this, and, and I will say we could dive really deep, and we would be here for centuries. I mean, there's a lot to this, which some are interested in discovering, and that's good. But others would say, you know, just give us the, the short version. I'm going to try to do that. So to begin, here are the quick basics. In the Torah... Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, those five books, sometimes called the Pentateuch. Sometimes Torah is used to refer to the entire Old Testament, but that's a very casual use of it. More accurately, it's the first five books. All of the books of the Old Testament together are referred to as the Tanakh by Jews. So in the Torah... God gives many commandments through Moses about how we are to live and act. And in fact, we heard those this morning in the readings, very intentionally, from Exodus and Ezekiel. And these rules that God gives, these commandments, these mitzvot, fall into two main categories. Category A readily explained and understood, and category B, not readily explained and understood. <laughs> category A includes rules of personal conduct. Don't steal, don't murder, don't envy, honor your mother and father, keep the Sabbath holy, worship only God, and so on. and rules about remembering God's work and love through celebrations, holy days, Purim, Passover, first fruits, Shavuot, trumpets, Shofarim, Rosh Hashanah, Days of Awe, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, and so on. The rules of personal conduct are pretty easily understood, and they're actually the basis for all modern law. The reason the Ten Commandments were often on the walls of our courtrooms was not because the judges were trying to convert everybody to be either a Jew or a Christian, but because those literally are the basis of modern law. The holy days are commanded to be celebrated every year forever, that's what it actually says, so that all the generations, past and future, will remember who God is and how they have been saved and preserved. Simple. Category B includes specifics for building and worshiping in the tabernacle and temple. And you heard that this morning. Now think about this. This is really category B. God doesn't explain why to make an ephod or why to make the garments of Aaron in the way that he describes with gold and um, blue and uh, all of the jewels and the turban and the sash and all of that. And actually, in preparing this, I went and looked at some of the images online for the ephod, and I realized 
something that we know about but sometimes need to remember. We have this modernist uh, hubris that what we do today is very highly detailed and accurate and what was done in the past is sort of primitive and really not that good. And so some of these representations of the ephod looked like something done in kindergarten with clay and stones. And somehow they imagined that's what the ephod that Aaron wore looked like. Those commands given by God through Moses are almost 4,000 years ago. And yet, if you look at art done by craftspeople around the world that goes back 4,000 years, it's stunning how good it is. I remember going to an exhibit um, at the Neue Kirche in um, Brussels. Uh, And it was an exhibit of art from the Kazakhs, an ancient tribe in uh, north of Turkey. And one of the things that they had there was a statue of a man about that tall, about an inch tall. Uh, You could tell that it was a statue of a man just looking at it with the naked eye. And if you put it under a microscope, you discovered that it had a jacket on and pants, buttons. You could see individual strands of hair on the head. And the face had perfectly formed eyes and nose and lips. It looked like a human being, fully formed, perfectly made, It was an inch tall, and it was 2,000 years old. I looked at it and just thought, how could they even do that? I can't even see that without a microscope. And so we need to remember that the commands that God gives about the excellence of the craftsmanship in creating the tabernacle and the ark and the garments for Aaron and his sons Those, doubtless, were among the most beautiful and fully rendered art that could be done. And it's in category B because we don't know why God commanded those specific things, and he didn't explain. Well, I'm doing the ephod this way, and I'm doing... He didn't explain. He commanded. He said, you will do this. And the only proper response to that was, yes, Lord. Category B also contains commands about what foods are prohibited or permitted to be eaten. These are also called unclean and clean. God does not offer an explanation of why this food is prohibited and that food is permitted. Over the centuries, there has been speculation that it's because the things that he says are permitted are healthier, and, it's, and there are benefits to following these rules. And actually, that's true to an extent. But it doesn't really explain all of the rules. And if you read them in detail, and there's a lot of detail, you can't find an explanation, just the commandment. Now, actually, most of the things that God prohibits are not in the Western diet anyway, other than pork and shellfish. A lot of the, there are certain kinds of insects that are permitted to be eaten. Most of them, no. Some, also okay. No explanation. He just says, this is food, this isn't food. Okay? So let me give you a brief review of, of what that says. This is from Leviticus 11.9. Among water dwellers, shellfish and other creatures lacking fins and scales are prohibited. But, quote, these you may eat out of all that are in the waters, everything in the waters that has fins and scales, whether in the seas or in the rivers, you may eat. So those are what permitted, fins and scales. Among land dwellers, Nearly all insects are prohibited, as is the eating or drink as is eating or drinking blood. 
prohibited. Also, quote, whatever parts the hoof, that is, has a cloven hoof, and chews the cud among the animals you may eat. Well, that would describe a cow. And the pig, because it parts the hoof and is cloven-footed but does not chew the cud, is unclean to you. I'll come back to that in a minute. But plants and their fruits are permitted. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. That's from Genesis. And of course, it gets much more detailed and complex, and there are volumes, literally volumes and volumes of debate on this subject, as well as volumes and volumes of traditional, not Bible-based, traditional instruction, typically Talmud or elsewhere, on how to do all of these things in an approved and kosher way. But a simple rule of thumb that largely covers the Western diet is no shellfish and no pork. Now I want to just stop here and point out something that most Christians don't realize. If you're raised a Jew, you realize these things. All Jews aren't the same. And not all Jews believe the same things. The old joke is where there are two Jews, there are three opinions. It's actually probably more like five or six opinions. I have several opinions myself about any subject, and some of them contradict each other. So if you were to look at the most basic of divisions within Judaism, it goes from orthodox, conservative, reform, reconstructionist, Atheist. Those are all denominations within Judaism. And if you see something advertised as a Jewish cultural center, it may well be atheist in its construction. They'll say, you know, we don't believe all that superstitious stuff, but we're Jews. So let's get together and eat, okay? And Reconstructionist is like a little more liberal than Reform. That's the spectrum, but it's not the only spectrum. That's mostly what Western Judaism looks like. There are also Karaites who don't believe any of the things that any of that group believes, and several other groups of Jews around the world who just have a different way of living and thinking. Now, you might think that's a lot, but among Christians, there's somewhere around 30,000 denominations. The big ones are Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Protestant, but all three of those divide and subdivide and subdivide, and they break up over the sometimes important, other times hard to understand reasons. I they're, don't need to go into it just to say religious people tend to um, get stuck in their certainties and have nothing to do with other people who don't share those certainties, okay? In fact, I'll tell you a, a joke which maybe will help understand this. There's something called a kosher pig. And here's the idea of a kosher pig. It's a, it's a pig that has a cloven hoof and chews its cud. Now, most pigs that you've ever seen in your life don't chew their cud. So the question is, if a kosher pig is discovered, a pig is found which has a cloven hoof and it chews its cud, is it okay for me as a Jew to eat it? That's the question. This is a rabbinical joke. So the Orthodox say, of course not, no way, we do it's a pig. We don't eat pig. That's the rule. No pig. I don't care if it chews its gut. It's a pig. No pig. We don't eat it. The conservative movement says, well, you know, we'd have to convene a committee uh, to study the claims made about this and then, of course, do an autopsy of the pig and investigate 
all of the parts inside, and depending upon the conclusions, maybe, maybe not. And the reform rabbi says, oh, heck yeah, we're serving it at my daughter's bat mitzvah. I tell the joke to show what the variety of response is, okay? It's not simple and it's not trivial, meaning that there's a lot of opinion and a lot of disagreement on the topic, period. And also, but, but, didn't Jesus declare all foods clean in Mark 17? And didn't God declare all food clean in Peter's vision of a sheet filled with animals? That's in Acts 10. And the answer is uh, no. That's not actually what those verses say or what they mean. There, there's something important going on there. That isn't it, and I'll come back to it. Yet for now, let's just assume that Jesus said everything's clean. No problem. Eat whatever you want. It, it's good. We're good to go. And so whether I'm a Jew or a Gentile, if I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm free of the kosher dietary rules, and I can eat any kind of food. Okay, let's just assume that's, that's the standard. Well, then why not exercise this freedom all the time? Why not use it to demonstrate that those who still follow kosher or other dietary restrictions demonstrate to them, we are free and you can be free too. All right. This is where the idea of hospitality as a sacred act taught in the Bible applies. And you heard it from Romans 14 today, which we'll go back to. It is where grace and love exceed the exercise of freedom. So let's first look at Romans 14. Feel free to go and read all of it when you're back home. But just for now, consider these sentences that Paul is writing to followers of Yeshua, of Yeshua in Rome. Both Gentiles and Jews are there. Some of the Gentiles previously worshipped Roman idols, and the emperor for that matter. Some of the Jews are strict in their food practices, and there are likely many other food traditions and rules in the congregation. And no doubt, disputes broke out among the various factions there, leading to animosity and self-righteousness from all sides toward all the others, not unlike some congregations today, not unlike usins. We do it. So let's consider this counsel from Paul. This is from Romans 14. Accept other believers who are weak in faith, and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. I could just stop there. But let me repeat it and then press on. Accept other believers who are weak in faith, and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. This is Paul to the congregation in Rome. Paul again. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything. But another believer with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. He's accepted them, both sides. He's accepted them. And then Paul says, who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Now, the illusion there is that if a person has a servant working for him, and he's instructed the servant to do a certain thing, that you have no right to criticize the servant 
because he's following his master's instructions. And so what Paul is saying is all of those who are followers of Yeshua are servants of God. And even if they're doing something God didn't tell you to do, you have no right to criticize them if they're doing what they believe God told them to do. You don't have a right to criticize someone else's servants, I would say parenthetically, especially if that someone else is God. Yeah, bite your tongue. He goes on. Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall. In other words, it's between the servant and the, and the master. You're not a part of this discussion. Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall. And with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. Listen to that. Somebody that you think is absolutely wrong, and they might be, has to stand before the one who they serve. And he judges whether they stand or fall. But he doesn't just whack them dead if they're off the path. He works with them to come back into alignment with who he is and what he desires. And with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval because he has brought them back to himself. Paul continues. Those who eat any kind of food do so to honor the Lord, since they give thanks to God before eating. Um, Rebecca has a, an expression which I'm very fond of. And she says, before I eat, I offer a bracha. And then what I eat is pleasing to the Lord. Those who eat any kind of food do so to honor the Lord since they give thanks to God before eating. And those who refuse to eat certain foods also want to please the Lord and give thanks to God. Paul continues. So let's stop condemning each other. Period, full stop. I could quit and sit down. But let me unpack this a little more. Paul again. Decide to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. Decide. This is a challenge. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. I should note this is hard. <laughs> this is a challenge. But it's right there in the scriptures that we honor. Paul again, I know and am convinced on the authority of the Lord Jesus that no food in and of itself is wrong to eat. But if someone believes it is wrong, then for that person, it is wrong. And if another believer is distressed by what you eat, you are not acting in love if you eat it. Don't let your eating ruin someone for whom Christ died. This is pretty serious stuff, isn't it? So then, Paul, let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. Don't tear apart the work of God over what you eat. Remember, all foods are acceptable, 
But it is wrong to eat something if it makes another person stumble. It is better not to eat meat, the Greek actually means just food, or drink wine, or do anything else if it might cause another believer to stumble. You may believe there's nothing wrong with what you are doing, but keep it between yourself and God. Blessed are those who don't feel guilty for doing something they have decided is right. Let me read that sentence again. This is pretty important. Blessed are those who don't feel guilty for doing something they have decided is right. And that doing includes both eating and abstaining. Both of those are doings in this sentence. This last verse says that a clear conscience in eating something another person might consider prohibited, maybe non-kosher, is in itself blessed by God. Eating with a clear conscience, even if it's non-kosher, is blessed by God. But if where and when you might do it could cause another to stumble, don't do it there and then. Rather, keep it between yourself and God and bless Bless the other person by not eating or drinking in a way that could cause them to stumble. More plainly, if you believe all kosher restrictions are lifted and you want a ham sandwich and a shrimp cocktail, eat them at home or only with others who will not be stumbled by your food. Equally, if you keep kosher as a choice, it's blessed by God. But don't condemn another who does not choose as you do. It's not hard to follow Paul's rule here. So New Jerusalem is a family, a congregation, intentionally sharing the gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, with both Gentiles and Jews, in some ways like the congregation in Rome that Paul wrote to. If a Jewish person comes among us and for their whole life has never eaten pork or shellfish, a basic version of biblical kosher, and sees that we observe these commandments, they feel welcome by our hospitality, accepted, not judged, and safe. It's a holy hospitality we extend to them. That's our standard of love and care, Paul's rule, basically. So then let us aim for harmony in the church, this is Paul, to build each other up. Don't tear apart the work of God over what you eat. Remember, all foods are acceptable, but it is wrong to eat something if it makes another person stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else if it might cause another believer to stumble. Over the years, this simple rule, no pork or shellfish, has served us, and those who visit us during Oneg, our weekly lunch, and during our Passover Seder, and at other meals that we share. It's a gift from our hearts, and so we maintain it. Now, I want to share... Two other things quickly. One is there was a year, several years ago, where we were preparing a Passover Seder. Uh, and we had said, you know, we have a simple rule. It doesn't follow the rabbinic rules about kosher, which I'll, I'll just talk about those for a second. Uh, if you go to the store and you see a package which has got a U on it, Um, That's the Orthodox Union. It's kosher. Uh, Sometimes it'll have a K. That means it's kosher. If it has a D, it means it's dairy, which is kosher. But according to the rabbis, it's not if you mix it with meat. Um, The Bible doesn't actually say that. The Bible says don't boil a goat's kid in the mother's milk. That's the prohibition. 
what the rabbis have done it has built what's called Agadot, a fence around the Torah with a bunch of uh, additional rules so that if you follow these rules, you'll be sure not to violate the Torah rules. Some of them make sense, some of them don't. <laughs> And so the don't mix meat and cheese is a rabbinic rule. It's not a, it's not a biblical rule, even for people who keep kosher. But this, this year, oh, and that's enough about, about things that are labeled kosher. So one year we're having the Passover Seder. Uh, and one of the people in the congregation is really ticked at me because I've said, it's an act of hospitality. Please, no pork or shellfish. And he came up and said, well, I'm coming to the Passover Seder. I'm planning on bringing a ham and putting it right in the center of all of the other food. I was almost speechless. It matters not to me that he eats ham at home, not for a minute. But it was clear that he was doing this both as an act of defiance of a simple, gracious, loving rule that we had, uh, and also to demonstrate how free he was while he considered other people bound because they didn't look at things the way that he did. And so the issue here is fundamentally about what I would call sacred hospitality. It is a way to say, you know, we, we minister to Gentiles and Jews. Um, imagine, if you would, and I apologize for this image in advance, but there are countries where dog is a regular part of the menu. I've been there. Imagine going there, from here, to the home of friends there who felt that it was their duty to put a leg of dog on your plate just to show you that they were free to eat that even though you didn't like it. I would find that extraordinarily offensive, and it is offensive. I can give other examples, even... <clears throat> even more graphic and disgusting than I know because I have friends who have been confronted in that way. This is not the gospel of Christ. It, it, there really has to be a sacredness about our welcoming of people into this congregation. We've even at a time had people who were regular attenders who followed much stricter kosher rules, and we set apart a separate cooking pot for them. I, I, I don't follow those rules, but I wanted to honor their presence with us by saying we make accommodations for this further restriction that, that you have. So, I'm not going into why um, Mark 7 doesn't say that thus he declared all foods clean. I'll post this online. You can go read it. That isn't in the Greek at all. And that idea is only about 100 years old. Um, I'll just say that much about it. Paul says in Romans 14 that he believes that we're free to eat anything. But he says, but don't eat something if it might cause another to stumble that the first law here really is love. It's a hospitality. It's a welcoming. And so now we have a Passover Seder coming up with our friends at Wheaton Christian Center. And Pastor Paul called me. And he knows the normal structure of a Seder. And there are bottles of wine. And in our case, we also put grape juice on tables for people who don't uh, drink wine, um, but there are bottles of wine, and there are four times during the service that some of that 
um, is uh, people drink it. And he said, I'm, I've really been praying about this and stewing about it and really worried about it. And it's this, that the norm in our congregation is that we don't drink. We don't drink alcohol. We certainly don't drink alcohol in church. He said, we recognize there are people in the congregation who do at home. That's okay. But our norm is to be teetotalers, that we don't, especially in church, we don't drink. And so I don't know how do we do this if we do a Passover together and you normatively have wine. And I said, boy, this is really easy. I would ask you guys, no pork or shellfish, and we will have no wine. <laughs> and he said, wow, that was easy. <laughs> I said, it's supposed to be. This is how Christians love each other. So th this is the short answer to the question, why no pork or shellfish? It, it really is following Paul's counsel in Romans 14. There's way more to it than that. But that's the, the sort of the simple version of it. It is grace that we extend as a messianic congregation of Jews and Gentiles um, as a part of how we share the love of Christ with others. Amen.